The Myth of the Machine by Lewis Mumford, Chapter 9, The Design of the Mega Machine. 1. The Invisible Machine. In doing justice to the immense power and scope of divine kinship, both as myth and active institution, I have so far left one important aspect for closer examination, its greatest and most durable contribution, the invention of the archetypal machine. This extraordinary invention proved in fact to be the earliest working model for all, la all later complex machines, though the emphasis slowly shifted from the human operatives to the more reliable mechanical parts. The unique act of kingship was to assemble the manpower and to discipline the organization that made possible the performance of work on a scale never attempted before. As a result of this invention, huge engineering tasks were accomplished 5,000 years ago that matched the best present performances in mass production, standardization and meticulous design. This machine escaped notice and so naturally remained unnamed until our own day when a far more powerful and up-to-date type, utilizing a conjuries of subordinate machines, came into existence. For convenience, I shall designate the archetypal form by more than one name, in reference to a specific situation. Because the components of the machine, even when it functioned as a completely integrated whole, were necessarily separate in space, I shall for certain purposes call it the invisible machine, when utilized to perform work on highly organized collective enterprises, I shall call it the labor machine. When applied to acts of collective coercion and destruction, it deserves the title, used even today, the military machine. But when all the components, political and economic, military, bureaucratic and royal, must be included, I shall usually refer to the mega machine, in plain words, the big machine. And the technical equipment derived from such a mega machine thence becomes megatechnics, as distinguished from the more modest and diversified modes of technology, which until our own century continued to perform the larger part of the daily work in the workshop and on the farm, sometimes with the help of power machinery. Men of ordinary capacity, relying on muscle power and traditional skills alone, were capable of performing a wide variety of tasks, including pottery manufacturing and weaving. Without any external direction or scientific in guidance, beyond that available in the tradition of the local community. Not so with the mega machine. Only kings, aided by the discipline of astronomical science and supported by the sanctions of religion, had the capability of assembling and directing the mega machine. This was an invisible structure composed of living, but rigid, human parts, each assigned to his special office, role, and task, to make possible the immense work output and grand designs of this great collective organization. At its inception, no inferior chief could organize the mega-machine and set it in motion. And though the absolute assertion of royal power rested on supernatural sanctions, Kingship itself would not have prevailed so widely had these claims not in turn been ratified by the colossal achievements of the mega machine. The invention was the supreme feat of early civilization, a technological exploit which served as a model for all later forms of mechanical organization. This model's model was transmitted, sometimes with all its parts in good working condition, sometimes in a makeshift form through purely human agents for some 5,000 years before it was done over in a material structure that corresponded more closely to its own specifications and was embodied in a comprehensive institutional pattern that covered every aspect of life. To understand the point of the machine's origin and its line of descent is to have a fresh insight into both the origins of our present over-mechanized -me culture and the faith and destiny of modern man. We shall find that the original myth of the machine projected the extravagant hopes and wishes that have come to abundant fulfillment in our own age. Yet at the same time it did imposed restrictions, abstentions and compulsions and servilities that, both directly and as a result of the counter-reactions they produced, 
today threaten even more mischievous consequences than they did in the Pyramid Age. We shall see, finally, that from the outset, all the blessings of mechanized production have been undermined by the process of mass destruction which the Mega Machine made possible. Though the Mega Machine was first assembled during the period when copper for tools and weapons came into use, it was an independent innovation. The mechanization of men had long preceded the mechanization of their working instruments in the far more ancient order of ritual. But once conceived, this new mechanism spread rapidly, just, not just by being imitated in self-defense, but by being forcefully imposed by kings, acting as only gods or the anointed representatives of gods could act. Wherever it was successfully put together, the mega machine multiplied the output of energy and performed labor on a scale that was never conceivable before. With this ability to concentrate immense mechanical forces, a new dynamism came into play, which overcame by the sheer impetus of its achievements, the sluggish routines and the petty inhibitions of small-scale village culture. With the energies available through the royal machine, the dimensions of space and time were vastly enlarged. Operations that once could hardly have been finished in centuries were now accomplished in less than a generation. On the level plains, man-made mountains of stone or baked clay, pyramids and cigarettes arose in response to royal command. In fact, the whole landscape was transformed and bore in its strict boundaries and geometric shapes that impressed uh, that imp the impress of both a cosmic order and an inflexible human will. No complex power machines at all comparable to this mechanization were utilized on any scale until clocks and water mills and windmills swept over Western Europe from the 14th century of our era on. Why did this new mechanism remain invisible to the archaeologists and the historian? For a simple reason already implied in our first definition, because it was composed solely of human parts, and it possessed a definite functional structure only as long as the religious exaltation, the magical abracadabra and the royal commands that put it together were accepted as beyond human challenge by all the members of society. Once the polarizing force of kinship was weakened, whether by death or defeat in battle, by skepticism or by vengeful uprising, the whole machine would collapse. Then its parts would either regroup in smaller units, such as feudal or urban, or completely disappear, much in the, same, in the way that a rooted army does when the chain of command is broken. In fact, these first collective machines were as subject to breakdown, were ultimately as frail and vulnerable as the theological magical conceptions that were essential to their performance. Hence, those who commanded them were in a constant state of anxious tension, often with good reason, fearing heresy or treason from their near equals and rebellions and reprisals on part of the submerged masses. Without submissive faith and unqualified obedience to the royal will, transmitted by governors, generals, bureaucrats, taskmasters, the machine would never have been workable. When these attitudes could not be sustained, the mega machine collapsed. From the beginning, the human machine presented two aspects, one negative, coercive, and two often destructive, the other positive, life-promoting, and constructive. Yet the second factor could not readily function unless the first were in some degree present. Though a primitive form of the military machine almost certainly came before the labor machine, it was the latter that achieved an incomparable perfection of performance, not alone in quantity of work done, but in the quality and complexity of its organized structures. Now, to call these collective entities machines is no idle play on words. If a machine be defined more or less in accord with the classic definition of François Rollot 
as a combination of resistant parts, each specialized in function, operating under human control to utilize energy and to perform work, then the great labor machine was in every aspect a genuine machine. All the more because its components, though made of human bone, nerve and muscle, were reduced to their bare mechanical elements and rigidly standardized for the performance of the limited tasks. The taskmaster's lash ensured conformity. Such machines had already been assembled, if not invented by kings in the early part of the pyramid age, from the end of the fourth millennium on. Just because of their detachment from any fixed external structures, these labor machines had much fuller capacities for change and adaption than the more rigid metallic counterparts of a modern assembly line. In the building of the pyramids we find not only the first indubitable evidence of the machine's existence, but the proof of its astonishing efficiency. Wherever kingship spread, the invisible machine, in its destructive if not its constructive form, went with it. This holds as true for Mesopotamia, India, China, Yucatan, Peru, as for Egypt. By the time the mega machine had taken form, all the preliminary stages had been obliterated, so we can only guess at the way in which its members were assorted, assigned their places, and trained in their duties. At some point in the process, an inventive mind, or more probably a series of inventive minds, following through the opening gambit, must have been able to grasp the essential problem, that of mobilizing a large body of men and rigor rigorously co coordinating their activities in both time and space for a predetermined, clearly envisaged and calculated purpose. The difficulty was to turn a random collection of human beings detached from their family and community and their familiar occupation each with a will, or at least a memory, of his or her own, into a mechanized group that could be manipulated at command. The secret of mechanical control was to have a single mind with a well-defined aim at the head of the organization, and the method, method of passing messages through a series of intermediate functionaries until they reached the smallest unit. Exact reproduction of the message and absolute compliance were both essential. This grand problem may well have been the first worked out in a quasi-military organization in which a relatively small body of hunters, roughly disciplined to obey their leader, were addressed to the task of controlling a much larger body of unorganized peasants. At all events, the type of mechanism created never operated without reserve of coercive force behind the word command, and both the method and the structure had been passed on, almost without change, to military organizations as we now know them. Through the army, in fact, the standard model of the mega machine was transmitted from culture to culture. If one single invention was necessary to make this larger mechanism operative for constructive tasks as well as coercion, it was probably the invention of writing. This method of translating speech into graphic record not merely made it possible to transmit impulses and messages through the system, but to fix accountability when written orders were not carried out. Accountability and the written word both went along historically with the control of large numbers, and it is no accident that the earliest uses of writing were not convey were not to convey ideas, religious or, other, or otherwise, but to keep temple records of grain, cattle, pottery, fabricated goods, stored and dispersed. This happened early, for a pre-dynastic Narmer mace in the Ashmolean Museum at Oxford records the taking of uh, one, 120,000 prisoners, 40,000 oxen, and 1,422,000 goats. The arithmetical record was an even greater feat than the capture. Action at a distance, through scribes and swift messengers, was one of the identifying marks of the new mega-machine. 
and if the scribes formed the favored profession, it was because this machine could not be effectively used without their constant service to encode or decode the royal messages. Quote, the scribe, he directeth every work that is in his in this land, end of quote, an Egyptian new kingdom composition tells us. In effect, they probably played as a part not too dissimilar to that of the political com uh, commissars introduced into the Soviet Russian army. They made possible the constant report to political headquarters essential for a centralized organization. Whether the military or the labor machine came first, they had the same organization. Were the Egyptian and Mesopotamian raiding parties and mining gangs military, or were they civil organizations? At first, these functions were indistinguishable, or rather interchangeable. In both cases, the fundamental unit was the squad, under the supervision of a gang boss. Even in the domains of the rich landed proprietors of the old empire, this pattern prevailed. According to Ehrman, this quads, the, the squads formed into companies, marching or parading under their own banner. At the head of each company of workmen stood the chief workman, who bore the title chief of the company. Nothing like this, one may venture to say, had ever been seen in an early Neolithic village. Quote, the Egyptian magistrate, end of quote, Erman observes, quote, cannot think of these people otherwise than collectively. The individual workman exists for him no more than the individual soldier exists for our higher army officers, end of quote. Precisely, this was the original pattern of the archetypal mega-machine and has never been radically altered. With the development of the mega-machine, the broad division of labor between functions and offices, long familiar to us in the army, was likewise applied at an early date to highly specialized parts of the working process. Flinders Petrier notes that in the realm of mining, a sphere wherein both in Egypt and Mesopotamia, the work army, I repeat, can hardly be distinguished from the military army, a minute division of labor had been established. Quote, we know from the mummy records, end of quote, Petri observed, how minutely work was subdivided. Every detail was allotted to the responsibility of an individual. One man prospected, another tested the rock, a third took charge of the products. There are over 50 different qualities and grades of officials and laborers named in mining expeditions, end of quote. These divisions inevitably became part of the broader social organization that operated beyond the closed domain of the mega machine. And by the time of Herod, uh, Herodotus visited Egypt in the 5th century BC, the overall, overall division of labor and the minute subdivision into specialisms, no longer confined to the mega machine, had reached a point comparable to that which it has come to in our own time. For he records that, quote, some physicians are for the eyes, others for the head, others for the teeth, others for the belly, and others for internal disorders, end of quote. But note that the difference between the ancient human machine and its more efficiently dehumanized de uh, de de modern rivals in both its method and its underlying purpose. Whatever the actual results of their employment, all modern machines are conceived as labor-saving devices. They attempt to perform the maximum amount of work with the least immediate expenditure of human effort. Labor-saving had no part in the institution of the earliest machines. Just the contrary, they were labor-using devices. And their inventors had reason to exult over the increased numbers of workers that they could by efficient design and organization, bring to bear on any given task, provided the job itself were big enough. The total effect of both types of machine was the same. They were designed to perform with efficiency and undeviating exactitude 
and with copious power. Tasks that could never be performed by individual tool users, more loosely organized. Both types of machine achieved a hitherto unattainable level of efficiency. But instead of freeing labor, the royal mega machine boasted of imprisoning and enslaving it. If purely humane modes of work, which men would undertake voluntarily to fulfill immediate needs, had prevailed, the colossal achievements of early civilization would probably have remained inconceivable. This must be granted. And it is even possible that the modern non-human machine, powered by extra, extra, extraneous uh, energies, meant to economize labor, might never have been invented, for the mechanical agents had first to be socialized before the machine itself could be fully mechanized. But at the same time, if the collective machine had not been able to utilize forced labor, either by periodic conscription or slavery, the colossal miscarriages, perversions and wastages that so constantly accompanied the machine might not have taken place. Two, mechanical standards of performance. Let us now examine the human machine in its archetypal form. As so often happens, there was a certain clarity in this first demonstration that was lost when the machine was diffused and worked into the more complex patterns of later societies, mingling with familiar, humbler survivals. And if the mega machine never achieved a higher peak of performance than in the pyramid age, this is perhaps not only because of the singular engineering talents that designed and operated these early machines, but also because the myth that held the human parts of the machine together could never again exert such a massive, attractive power, unstained as it was until the sixth dynasty by any serious letdowns and failures. Until then, its triumphs were indisputable, its chronic perversities still unexposed. Among all the feats of construction in which the mega machine excelled, the pyramid stands forth as an archetypal model. In its elemental geometric form, in the exquisite accuracy of its measurements, in the organization of the entire workforce, in the sheer mass of construction involved, the final pyramids demonstrate the perfection of the unique properties of this new technical complex. To exhibit the properties of this system, I shall concentrate upon the pyramid alone, in particular the Great Pyramid of Giza. The Egyptian pyramid was conceived as a tomb to hold the embalmed body of the pharaoh and secure his safe passage into the afterlife. The king alone, at first, had a prospect of such godlike extension of his existence. In mummy and pyramid, time symbolically stood still forever. This heavenly destination of the king altered every earthly prospect, but as with the consequence of space today, the common man played no part in it, except to pay the bill in taxes and forced labor. Between the first stone pyramid, built in the steppe, form we find later in Mesoamerica, and the mighty pyramids of Cheops, fourth dynasty, the first and the most enduring of the seven wonders of the ancient world lies less than a century and a half, a change comparable in speed to the development of steel frame building construction in our own age. On the ancient timescale for inventions, the most primitive form and the final one, never again to be called, equaled were practically contemporary. The swiftness of this development indicates a concentration of physical power and technical imagination. That transformation is all the more striking because the pharaoh's tombs did not stand alone. They were part of a whole city of the dead, a complex structure with buildings that housed the priests who conducted the elaborate rituals deemed necessary to ensure a happy future existence for the departed divinity. The Great Pyramid is one of the most colossal and perfect examples 
of the engineer's art at any period or in any culture. Even without allowing for the primitive character of the tools available in the 3rd millennium BC, no construction of our own day surpasses this in either technical virtuosity or audacity. And yet this great enterprise was undertaken by a culture that was just emerging from the Stone Age and was long to continue using stone tools, though copper was available for the chisels and saws that shaped the massive building stones for the new monuments. All the operations were performed by hand. National conscription, <clears throat> if not serfdom or slavery, was an essential part of the system, essential as a source of sufficient energy. Even the priesthood, Ehrman tells us, was not absolved from forced labor. The actual operations were performed by specialized handicraft workers, aided by an army of unskilled or semi-skilled laborers, drafted at quarterly intervals from agriculture. The whole job was done with no other mechanical aids than two simple machines of classic mechanics, the inclined plane and the lever. For as yet neither wheel nor pulley nor screw had been invented. We know from graphic representations that large stones were hauled on sledges by battalions of men across the desert sands. But note, the single stone slab that covers the inner chamber of the Great Pyramid where the pharaoh lay weighted 50 tons. An architect today would think twice before calling for such a mechanical exploit. Now the Great Pyramid is more than a formidable mountain of stone, 755 feet square at the base, rising to a height of 481.5 feet. It is a structure with a complex interior, consisting of a series of passages at different levels that lead into the final burial chamber. Yet every part of it was built with a kind of precision that, as Breasted, property, uh, Breasted properly emphasized, belongs to the watchmaker's art rather than that of a modern bridge builder or skyscraper constructor. Blocks of stone were set together with seams of considerable lengths, showing joints of one ten thousandth of an inch while the dimensions of the sides at the base differ by only 7.9 inches in a structure that covers acres. In short, fine measurements, undeviating mechanical precision, and flawless perfection are no monopolies of the present age. The pharaonic social organization had leaped ahead 5,000 years to create the first large-scale power machine, a machine whose total output was from 25,000 to 100,000 manpower, at the very minimal, the, the equivalent of 2,500 horsepower. Obviously, no ordinary human hands, no ordinary human effort, no ordinary kind of human collaboration, such as was available in the building of village huts and the planting of fields, could have mustered this superhuman force or have achieved this almost supernatural result. Only a divine king could demand such a massive act of the collective human will and effect such a large-scale material transformation. Was it possible to accomplish such massive engineering feats without the aid of a machine? Emphatically not. Only a complex power machine could fabricate these immense constructions. The ultimate product itself showed that it was not only the work of a machine, but of a, of a highly refined type of machine. Though the material equipment of dynastic Egypt was still crude, patient workmanship and disciplined method made good these shortcomings. This mega machine was composed of a multitude of uniform, specialized, interchangeable, but functionally differentiated parts, rigorous rigorously marshaled to get together and coordinated in a process centrally organized and centrally directed, each part behaving as a mechanical component of the mechanized whole. In some three centuries, possibly in half that time in Egypt, the human machine had been perfected. The kind of mind 
that designed the pyramids and the massive temples and walled cities represented a new human type capable of affecting the abstract organization of complex functions in a structural design whose final form determined every stage in the work. Not merely mathematical calculations, but meticulous astronomical observations were necessary for the sighting of these great stru structures, so that each side was oriented exactly in line with the true points of the compass. These fine measurements called for a rigorous standard of workmanship and unsurpassed until our own era. Since at inund inundation the pyramid site is only one quarter of a mile from the river, a rock foundation which demanded the removal of sand was needed. The Great Pyramid, the perim perimeter of its bed, deviates from true level by little more than half an inch. The minds that solved these problems and carried out these designs were obviously minds of the highest order, with a unique combination of theoretic analysis, practical grasp, and imaginative foresight. Imhotep, who built the first stone pyramid of Saqqara, was a minister of state, an architect, an astronomer, and a physician. No narrowly trained specialists or experts, these but men who moved freely over the entire era, area of existence, like the great artists of the Italian Renaissance. Their prowess and their self-confidence were equal to any occasion, indeed sometimes defied prudence and outstripped the powers of the mighty machines, as later in the embedded Asuan obelisk, weighing 1,168 tons, never finally detached from the solid rock. Now the workers now the workers who carried out these designs also had minds of a new order, mechanically conditioned, executing each task in strict obedience to instructions, infinitely patient, limiting the response to the word of command. Machine work can be done only by machines. These workers, during their period of service, were, as it were, stripped down to the re reflexes in order to ensure a mechanically perfect performance. The leaders never, nevertheless could read written orders and the men employed may have recognized a few signs for they left their names in red ochre, Edwards tells us, on the blocks of the medium pyramid. Boat gang, vigorous gang, craftsmen gang and so forth. In their inurement to mechanical order, they would have felt at home today on any assembly line. Only the naked pinup girl was lacking. Alike in organization, in mode of work, in rapid tempo of production and in production, in, and, and in product, there is no doubt that the machine which built the pyramids and the great temples, and which performed all the great constructive work of civilization, in other areas and cultures, were true machines. In their basic operations, they collectively performed the equivalent of a whole corpse of power shovels, bulldozers, tractors, mechanical saws, and pneumatic drills, with an exactitude of measurement, a refinement of skill, and an even output of work that would still be a theme for boasting today. These characteristics were no monopoly of Egypt, the German excavators at the site of Uruk recognized that the construction of only one of the proto-literate temple complexes there must have taken 1,500 men, each working a 10-hour day, five years to build. This extension of magnitude in every direction, this raising of the ceiling of human effort, this subordination of individual aptitudes and interests to the mechanical job in hand, and this unification of a multitude of subordinates to a single end derived from one source alone, the divine power exercised by the king. The king, or rather kingship, was the prime mover. In turn, the staring, staring success of the enterprise confirmed that power. Such strict, all-embracing order began, one must remember, at the top, 
consciousness of the predictable movement of the sun and the planets, or, if Celia Nuttall's old surmise was right, the even more steadfast and predictable position of the pole star. In giant collective works, as in the temple ceremonials, it was the king who gave forth the original commands, the king who demanded absolute conformity and who pun punished even trivial disobedience. It was the king who alone had the godlike power of turning men into mechanical objects and assembling these objects in a machine. The order that was transmitted from heaven through the king was passed on to every part of the machine and in time created an underlying mechanical unity in other institutions and activities. They began to show the same regularity that characterized the movements of the heavenly bodies. No older vegetation myth, no fertility god, could establish this abstract order or detach so much power from immediate service to life. But note, only the minority who were closely attached to the mega machine could fully share this power, while those who resisted it courted death as well as might they resist the stars in their courses. Despite repeated setbacks and failures, these cosmic fantasies have remained intact to this day. Indeed, they have come back again in the guise of absolute weapons and absolute sovereignty, the far from innocent hallucinations of the nuclear age. Three, the monopoly of power. To understand the structure or the performance of the human machine, one must do more than center attention upon the points where it materialized. Even our present technology, with its vast reticulation of visible machines, cannot be understood in those terms alone. Two devices were essential to make the machine work. A reliable organization of knowledge, natural and supernatural, and an elaborate structure for giving orders, carrying them out, and following them through. The first was incorporated in the priesthood, without whose active aid the institution of divine kinship could not have come into existence. The second, in a bureaucracy. Both were, were hierarchical organization, at whose apex stood the high priest and the king. Without their combined efforts, the power complex could, complex could not operate effect effectively. This condition remains true today, though the existence of automated factories and computer-regulated units conceals both the human components and the religious ideology essential even to current automation. What would now be called science was an integral part of the new machine system from the very beginning. This orderly knowledge, which was based on cosmic regularities, flourished, as we have seen, with the cult of the sun. Star watching and calendar, calendar making coincided with and supported the institution of kingship, even though no small part of the effort of the priests and soothsayers was, in addition, devoted to interpreting the meaning of singular events, such as the appearance of comets, eclipses of the sun or moon, or erratic natural phenomena, such as the flight of birds, or the state of a sacrificed animal's entrails. No king could move safely or effectively without the support of such organized higher knowledge. Any more than the Pentagon can move today without consulting its specialized scientists, technical experts, game theorists and computers, a new hierarchy supposedly less valuable than the entrails diviners. But, to judge by their gross miscalculations, not notably so. To be effective, this kind of knowledge must remain a secret priestly monopoly. If everyone had equal access to the source of knowledge and to the system of interpretation, no one would believe in their infallibility, since their errors could then not be concealed. Hence the shocked protest of Ipuwer against the revolu revolutionaries who overthrew the old kingdom in Egypt was based on the fact that the secrets of quote, the secrets of the temple lay unbared, end of quote, 
That is, they had made classified information public. Secret knowledge is the key to any system of total control. Until printing was invented, the written word remained largely a class monopoly. Today the language of higher mathematics plus computerism has restored both the secrecy and the monopoly with the consequent resumption of totalitarian control. Not the least affiliation of kinship with the worship of the sun was the fact that the king, like the sun, exerted force at a distance. For the first time in history, power became effective outside the immediate range of hearing or the arm's reach. No military weapon by itself sufficed to convey such power. What was needed was a special form of transmission gear, an army of scribes, messengers, stewards, superintendents, gang bosses, major and minor executives whose very existence depended upon their faithfully carrying out the king's orders, or, more immediately, those of his powerful ministers and generals. <clears throat> in other words, a well-organized bureaucracy is an integral part of the mega-machine, a group of men capable of transmitting and executing a command with the ritualistic punctilio of a priest, the mindless obedience of a soldier. To fancy that bureaucracy is a relatively recent institution is to ignore the annals of ancient history. The first documents that attest the existence of bureaucracy belong to the Pyramid Age. In a cenotaph description at Abydos, a career official under Pepi I in the 6th dynasty, 2375 BC, reported, quote, his Majesty, Majesty sent me at the head of his, his, this army, while the counts, while the seal bearers of the king of Lower Egypt, while the sole companions of the palace, while the nomarchs, the governors, and majors of Upper and Lower Egypt, the companions and chief drogomans, the chief prophets of Upper and Lower Egypt, and the chief bureaucrats were each at the head of a troop of Upper or Lower Egypt, or of the villages and towns which they, which they might rule." End of quote. Not merely does this text establish a bureaucracy, but like Petrius' evidence quoted earlier, it shows that the division of labor and specialization of functions necessary for efficient mechanical operation had already taken place. This development had begun at least three dynasties earlier, not by accident with the building of the great stone pyramid of Djoser at Saqqara. John Wilson observed in City Invisible that, quote, we credit Djoser not only with the beginnings of monumental architecture in stone in Egypt, but also with the setup of a new monster, the bureaucracy, end of quote. This was no mere coincidence, and W.F. Albright commented upon this Commenting upon this, pointed out that, quote, the greater number of titles found in the ceilings of the First Dynasty certainly presupposes an elaborate officialdom of some kind, end of quote. Once the hierarchic structure of the human machine was established, there was no theoretical, theoretical limit to the number of hands it might control or the power it might exert. The removal of human dimensions and organic limits constitutes, indeed, the chief boast of such an authoritarian machine. Part of its productivity is due to its use of unstinted physical coercion to overcome human laziness or bodily fatigue. Occupational specialization was a necessary step in the assemblage of the human machine. Only by intense concentration of skill at every part of the process could the superhuman accuracy and perfection of the product have, product have been achieved. The large-scale division and subdivision of labor throughout modern industrial society begins at this point. The Roman maxim that the law does not concern itself with trivial matters applies likewise to the mega-machine. The forces that were set in motion by the king demanded collective enterprises of a commensurate order, great earth-moving operations that turned rivers, dug canals, built walls. 
As with modern technology, the machine tended increasingly to dictate the purpose to be served and to exclude other more intimate human needs. These human machines were by nature large and impersonal, if not deliberately dehumanized. They had to operate on a big scale, or they could not work at all, for no bureaucracy, however efficient, could hope to govern directly a thousand little workshops and farms, each with its own traditions, its own craft skills, its own willful personal pride and sense of responsibility. To the rigid form of control manifested in the collective machine was until our own time confined to great mass enterprises and large-scale operation. This original defect limited the extension of megatechnics until mechanical substitutes for the human operatives could be invented. The importance of the bureaucratic link between the source of power, the divine king, and the actual human machines that perform the works of construction or destruction can hardly be exaggerated. All the more because it was the bureaucracy that collected the annual taxes and tributes that supported the new social pyramid and forcibly assembled the manpower that formed the new mechanical fabric. The bureaucracy was, in fact, the third type of invisible machine. One might call it a communications machine coexistent with the military and labor machines, and an integral part of the final totalitarian structure. Not the least important qualification of a classic bureaucracy is that it originates nothing. Its function is to pass on, without alteration or deviation, the orders that come from above, from central headquarters. No merely local information or human consideration is admitted to alter this inflexible transmission process. Only corruption or outright, outright rebellion can modify this rigid organization. Such an administrative method ideally requires a studious repression of all the autonomous functions of the personality and the readiness to perform the daily task with ritual exactitude. Not for the first time, as we have seen, does such a ritual order enter into the process of work. Indeed, it seems, more, it seems highly unlikely that submission to colorless repetition could have been achieved at this point without the millennial discipline of religious ritual. Bureaucratic regimentation was in fact part of the larger regimentation of life introduced by this power-centered culture. Nothing emerges more clearly from the pyramid texts themselves with their wearisome repetition of formula than a colossal capacity for enduring monotony, a capacity that anticipates the peak of universal boredom achieved in our own day. This verbal compulsiveness is the cycle side of the systematic general compulsion that brought the labor machine into existence. Only those who were sufficiently docile to endure this regimen, or sufficiently infantile to enjoy it, at every stage from command to execution could become efficient units in the human machine. Four, the magnification of personality. The marks of this cosmic mechanical order can be easily recognized. To begin with, as noted before, there was a change of scale. The habit of thinking big was introduced with the first human machine. For a superhuman scale, individual structures magnified the sovereign authority. At the same time, it tended to reduce the apparent size and importance of all the necessary human components except the energizing and polarization, a polarizing central element, the king himself. Paradoxically, the monopoly of power brought about a monopoly of personality too, for only the king was endowed with all the attributes of personality, both those, those incorporated in the communal group and those that, precisely at this period, it would seem, were slowly beginning to emerge in the human soul, which was now pecking through the social shell 
in which his embryonic existence had been spent. At this early stage, personality and power went together, both centered in the king. For the sovereign alone could make decisions, alter ancient local customs, create structures, and perform collective feats that had never been imagined, still less carried out before. In short, he could behave like a responsible person, capable of rational choice, released from tribal custom, free to be, when the situation demanded, a nonconformist, unable to introduce by edict and law deviations from the ancestral pattern. Like the king's original monopoly, that of immortality, some of these prerogatives would, under pressure, be passed along eventually to the whole community. But here it is the magnification that must be noted. All the old dimensions were overpassed, just as the fiscal bounds of the village horizon and the small group were lifted. Now the sky was the limit, and the city was no less than a whole world in itself, closer to heaven in every dimension. Both in practice, and perhaps even more in fantasy, these magnifications applied to time and space. Cromer notes that in the early dynasties, reigns of incredible length are attributed to legendary kings. A total of close to a quarter of a million years for the eight kings before the flood, and a total of 25,000 years for the first two dynasties after the flood. This tallies with similar periods that Egyptian priests were still assigning to ancient history when Herodotus and Plato visited them. Plato visited them. Even in pure fantasy, uh, these are big numbers. This new cultural trait reached a climax in the abstract calculations of the Maya, Thompson tells us, quote, on one stella at the city of Quiriqua, Accurate computation sweeps back over 90 million years. On another stella, at the same time the date reached is some 400 million years ago. End of quote. But this multiplication, multiplication of years was only the secular side of the more general expansion of power, symbolized in the royal claim to immortality. In the beginning this was, in Egypt, solely the attribute of the divine king, even though, as one notes in Sumer, where the entire court was simultaneously massacred in the interior of the royal tomb in Ur, in order to presumably to accompany the sovereign to another world, the servants and the ministers of the king must also share this hope for immortality. In the Sumerian deluge, myth, Siusundra, the king, Noah's counterpart, is rewarded by the gods An and Enlil, not by a symbolic rainbow, but by being given eternal, quote, life like a god, end of quote. The desire for life without limits was part of the general lifting of limits which the first great assemblage of power by means of the Megashine brought about. Human weaknesses, above all the weaknesses of mortality, were both contested and defied. But if the biological inev inevitability of death and disintegration mock the infantile fantasy of absolute power which the human machines, machine promised to actualize, life mocks at it even more. The notion of eternal life with neither conception, growth, fru fruition, nor decay, an existence as fixed as sterilized, as loveless, as purposeless, as unchanging as that of a royal mummy, is only death in another form. What is this but a return to the estate of arrest and fixation exhibited by the stable chemical elements that have not yet combined in sufficiently complex mo molecules to promote novelty and creativity? From the standpoint of human life, indeed of all organi organic existence, this assertion of absolute power was a confession of psychological immaturity, a radical failure to understand the natural processes of birth and growth, of maturation and death. 
The cult of the old fertility gods never shrank from facing death. It sought no monumental mockery in stone, but promised rebirth and renewal in the rhythmic order of life. What kingship promised was a grandiloquent eternity of death. If the gods of power had not triumphed, if kingship had not found a negative mode of increasing the scope of the human machine and therewith elevating the royal claim to absolute obedience, the whole further course of civilization might have been different. Along with the desire for eternal life, achieved by material as well as magical agents, kings and their gods nourished other ambitions that carried over the centuries to become part of the vulgar, vulgar mythology of our own age. Etana, in the Sumerian fable, mounts an eagle to go in search of a curative herb for his sheep when they are stricken with st uh, sterility. At this early date, the dream of human flight was born, or at least was recorded, though that dream still seemed so presumptuous that Etana, like Daedalus, was hurled to death as he neared his goal. Soon, however, kings were guarded by winged bulls, and they had at their command heavenly messengers who conquered space and time in order to bring commands and warnings to their earthly subjects. Rockets and television sets were already beginning secretly to germinate within this royal myth of the machine. The genie of the Arabian Nights are only popular later continuations of these earlier forms of power magic. This power drive, which was the mark of the sky-oriented religions, became in turn an end in itself. With the span of early civilization, 3000 to 600 BC, the formative impulse to exercise absolute control over both nature and man shifted back and forth between gods and kings. Joshua commanded the sun to stand still and destroy the wall of Jericho by martial music. But Jehovah himself, at an early moment, anticipated the nuclear age by destroying Sodom and Gomorrah with a single visitation of fire and brimstone, and a while later he even resorted to germ warfare in order to demoralize the Egyptians and aid in the escape of the Jews. In short, none of the destructive fantasies that have taken possession of leaders in our own age, from Kemal Atatürk to Stalin, from the Khans of the Kremlin to the Khans of the Pentagon, were foreign to the souls of the divinely appointed founders of the first machine civilization. With every increase of effective power, extravagantly sadistic and murderous impulses erupted out of the unconscious. This is the trauma that has distorted the subsequent development of all civilized societies, and it, it is this fact that punctuates the entire history of mankind with outbursts of collective paranoia and tribal delusions of grandeur, mingled with malevolent suspicion, murderous hatreds, and at atrociously inhumane acts. Paradoxically, despite the promise of an endless afterlife, the other great prerogative of these royal techniques is speed. All the king's projects must be executed within his own lifetime. Speed itself, in any operation, is a function of effective power and in turn becomes one of the chief means of ostentatiously displaying it. So deeply has this part of the myth of the machine become one of the basic assumptions of our own technology that most of us have lost sight of its point of origin. But royal commands, like urgent commands in the army, must be performed on the double. The current commitment to supersonic locomotion as a status symbol, already comically exposed in the intercontinental oscillations of the jet set in business and government, has its beginnings here. Nothing better illustrates this acceleration of pace than the fact that in Egypt, as later in Persia, each new monarch in the Pyramid Age built a new capital for use in his own lifetime. 
Compare this with the centuries needed to build a medieval cathedral and free cities that lacked royal resources for assembling power. On the practical side, road building and canal building, which were the chief means for hastening transportation, have been all through history the favorite form of royal public works, a form that reached a brief technological peak in the Iron Age with, when the Romans under Nero, Nero planned the cutting of the Corinth Canal through 98 feet of dirt rock, a work that, if it had been consummated, would have topped all the roads and aqueducts constructs. Only an economy of abundance at a time when there were at most probably only four or five million people in the Nile Valley could have, for have afforded to drain off the labor of a hundred thousand men annually and provided them with sufficient food to perform their colossal task. For in relation to the welfare of the community, there was the most sterile possible use of manpower. Though many Egyptologists cannot bring themselves to accept the implications, John Maynard Keynes' notion of pyramid building as a necessary device for coping with the surplus labor force in an affluent society whose rulers are averse to social justice and economic equalization was not an inept metaphor. This was an archetypal example of stimulated productivity, rocket building, is our exact modern equivalent. Five, the labors of consumption. But the most lasting economic contribution of the first myth of the machine was the separation between those who worked and those who lived in idleness on the surplus extracted from the worker by reducing his standard of living to penury. Forced poverty made possible forced labor in an agricultural society, both rested on the royal monopoly, monopoly of land and the control of usufruct. According to Akkadian and Babylonian, Babylonian scriptures, the gods created men in order to free themselves from the hard necessity of work. Here, as in so many other places, the gods prefigured in fantasy what kings actually did. In times of peace, kings and nobles lived by the pleasure principle, eating, drinking, hunting, playing games, copulating, all in ostentatious excess. So, at the very period when the myth of the machine was taking form, the problems of an economy of abundance first became visible in the behavior and the fantasies of the ruling classes, here too mirroring in advance the processes at work in our own age. If we note attentively the aberrations of the ruling classes throughout history, we shall see how far most of them were from how far most of them were from understanding the limitations of mere physical power and of a life that centered upon an effortless consumption, the reduced life of the parasite on a tolerant host. The boredom of set satiety dogged this economy of surplus power and surplus goods from the very beginning. It led to insight insensate personal luxury and even more insensate acts of collective delinquency and destruction. Both were means of establishing the superior status of the ruling minority whose desires knew no limits and whose crimes turned into Nietzschean virtues. One early example of the vexing problems of affluence lies at hand. An Egyptian story translated by Flinders Petrie, reveals the emptiness of a pharaoh's life in which every desire was too easily satisfied and time hung with unbearable heaviness on his hands. Desperate, he appealed to his counselors for some relief from his bed boredom and one of them put forth a classic suggestion that he fill a boat with thinly veiled, almost naked girls who would paddle over the water 
and sing songs for him. For the hour, the pharaoh's dreadful tedium, to his great delight, was overcome, for, as Petri aptly remarks, the vizier had invented the first musical review, that solace of the tired businessmen and soldiers on leave. Too often, however, these passing modes of relief proved insufficient. Among the all too scanty literary documents as yet unearthed, unearthed, two dialogues on suicide significantly remain, one Egyptian and one Mesopotamian. In each case, a member of the privileged classes, with every luxury and sensual gratification open to him, finds his life intolerable. His facile dreams are unsalted by reality. The Egyptian debate between a man and his soul dates from the period following the disintegration of the Pyramid Age and betrays the desperation of an upper-class person who had lost faith in the ritualistic exaltation of death as the ultimate fulfillment of life, which rationalized the irrationalities of high Egyptian society. But the Mesopotamian dialogue between a rich master and his slave, dating from the first century BC, is even more significant. For the principle finds that no piling up of wealth, power, or sexual pleasure produces a meaningful life. Another 7th century BC dialogue about human misery expands the theme. The fact that it has been called a Babylonian ecclesiastes indicates the depth of its pessimism and bitterness of power unrelieved by love, the emptiness of wealth condemned to enjoy only the goods that money can buy. If this is what the favored few could expect, in justification of thousands of years of arduous collective effort and sacrifice, it is obvious that the cult of power from the beginning was based upon a gross fallacy. Ultimately, the end product proved as life-defeating for the master classes as the mechanisms itself, mechanism itself for the disinherited and socially dismembered workers and slaves. In short, from its earliest point of development on, under the myth of divine kinship, the demoralizing accomplishment uh, accompaniments of unlimited power were revealed in both legend and recorded history. But these defects were for long overlaid by the exorbitant hopes the invisible machines awakened. Though a multitude of single inventions for long lay beyond the scope of the collective machine, which could provide only partial and clumsy substitutes, the fundamental animus behind these inventions the effort to conquer space and time, to speed transportation and communication, to expand human energy through the use of cosmic forces, to vastly increase industrial productivity, to overstimulate consumption, and to establish a system of absolute centralized control over both nature and man, all had been planted and richly nurtured in the soil of fantasy during the first era of the mega machine. Some of the seeds shot up at once in riotous growth. Others required 5,000 years before they were ready to sprout. When that happened, the divine king would appear again in a new form, and the same infantile ambitions would accompany him, inflated beyond any previous dimension, different only because they were at last realizable. Six, the age of the builders. Now, no institution can thrive solely on its self-deceptions and illusions. Even after allowing for its many heavy impositions and flagrant mischiefs, the mega machine must still be counted as one of the greatest of mechanical inventions. It is doubtful, indeed, whether non-human machines 
would have been pushed to their present perfection if the elementary lessons in machine building had not first been made with malleable human units. Not merely was the mega machine the model for all later complex machines, but it served to bring a necessary order and continuity and predictability into the rough and tumble of daily life, once the food supply and the kennel system had overpassed the boundaries of the little Neolithic village. What is more, the mega machine challenged the capricious uniformities of tribal custom by introducing a more rational method, potentially universal, that made for greater efficiency. For the mass of men, it is true, the restricted, inhibited, often oppressive, specialized mode of life that civilization imposed did not make sense as compared with that of the village whose inner compulsions and conformities were of a more humane order. But the whole structure produced by the mega machine had immeasurably greater significance, for it gave the smallest unit of cosmic destiny that transcended, transcended mere biological existence or social continuity. In the new cities, all the dissevered human parts were brought together, together seemingly in a higher unit. As we shall see, when we make a fuller canvas of the mega machine, the many negative factors that accompanied it from the start became more formidable instead of diminishing with its success. But before examining these negative traits, one must account for both the practical success and the apparent popularity of this institution over many ages and in many different cultures. At the start, the virtues of divine kinship must have bedazzled all men, for this was the age of the builders, and the new cities that arose were deliberately designed as a simulacrum of heaven. Never before had so much energy been available for magnificent permanent public works. Soon, cities set on man-made mounds rose 40 feet above the flood, with great walls 20, even 50 feet thick, wide enough at the top for those for two chariots to drive abreast. Likewise, palaces were built, big enough to house 5,000 armed men, who fed and drank from communal kitchens, to say nothing of temples, like those at Sumer, 80 feet high, whose sacred enclosure was surrounded by another wall. Such temenos was big enough to hold most of the population of a city, to witness the sacred ceremonies. Great building, buildings whose baked clay surfaces were coated with brilliant glazes, even gold, sometimes encrusted with semi-precious metals, embellished at intervals by monumental scriptures of lions or bulls, domino dominated the new cities of Mesopotamia, and similar constructs, constructions in different forms and materials appeared everywhere. Such buildings naturally fostered communal pride. Vicariously, the meanest drudge in the new ceremonial centers and cities participated in these feats of power, these wonders of arts, daily witnessing a life that was entirely beyond the reach of the humble peasant or herdsman. Even for the distant villager, these monumental structures served as magnets, which periodically, on festal days, would draw people from all over the land to the great capitals, to Abydos or Nippur, as later to Jerusalem or Mecca, to Rome or Moscow. These great constructive activities served as foundation for a more intense, consciously directed kind of life, in which ritual was transposed into drama, in which conformity was challenged by new practices, new resources, coming from every part of the Great Valley, in which there was a sharpening of individual minds through constant intercourse with other superior minds. In short, the new life of the city, in which every previous ex aspect of existence was in intensified and magnified. This urban life transcended that of the village in every dimension, importing raw materials greater distances, rapidly introducing new techniques, mixing different racial and na national types. 
in the city in history, I have paid due tribute to these collective expressions of order and beauty. Though villages and country towns set the original patterns of settlement, the construction and culture, cultural elevation of the whole city was largely the works of the mega machine. The rapidity of its erection and the enlargement of all its dimensions, particular its central nucleus, the temple, the palace and the granary, bear testimony to royal direction. Walls, fortifications, high roads, can channels and cities remain in every age what they were in the age of the builders, supreme acts of the sovereign power. At the beginning this was no constitutional abstraction, but a living person. Throughout history, this original image of the city called forth human devotion and effort. The great mission of kinship has been to overcome the particularism and isolationism of small communities, to wipe out the often meaningless differences that separate one human group from another, and prevent them from interchanging ideas, inventions and other goods that might, in the end, intensify their individuality. Under kingship, common standards were set up for weights and measures. Boundaries were not merely clearly marked out, marked, but partly because of the expansion of royal power, widened, bringing more communities into a system of cooperation. Under a common code of law, conduct became more orderly and predictable, and frivolous deviations became less frequent. To an unappreciable extent, this gain in law and order laid the foundation for a wider freedom. It opened the door to a world in every part of which any member of the human race might be at home, as if in his own village. To the extent that kinship promised such helpful uniformity and universality, every community and every member of the community stood to benefit. In the building of the city, and all the special institutions that accompanied, accompanied it, kingship came to its greatest constructive culmination. Most of the creative activities we associate with civilization can be traced back to this original implosion of social and technical forces. These works created a well-founded confidence in human powers, different from the illusions and naive self-deceptions of magic. Kings demonstrated how much populous communities, once they were collectively organized in great mechanical units, could actually accomplish. This was an august achievement, and the vision that made it possible may honestly have seemed godlike. Had it not produced distortions in the human psyche, the results might have spread beneficently in time through all human activities, elevating and enhancing every common function and purpose throughout the planet. The mighty cultural heroes and kings who fabricated the mega machine and performed these tasks from Gilgamesh and Imhotep to Sargon and, Alex and Alexander the Great roused their contemporaries from a sluggish, passive acceptance of cramped, natural, so to speak, limits. They called upon them to plan the impossible. And when the work was done, that which had seemed impossible of human performance had in fact been realized. From around 3500 BC on, nothing that man could imagine seemed to lie, ent lie entirely beyond the reach of royal power. For the first time in man's development, it would seem, the human personality, at least in a few self-elevated but representative figures, transcended the ordinary limits of space and time. By identification and vicarious participation, as a witness if not an active aid, the common man had an exalted sense of human potentiality as expressed in the myths of the gods, the astronomical knowledge of the priests, and the far-reaching decisions and activities of kings. Within a single lifetime, the mind might encompass a higher 
state of creativity and a richer consciousness of being than had ever been open to any living creature before. This, and not the widening of trade opportunities or the march of empires, was the most significant part of the so-called urban revolution. Though this heightening of the sense of human possibilities was the work of an audacious minority, it could not, like the astronom astronomical lore of the priesthood, remain secret knowledge, for it permeated every activity of civilization and gave it an aura of beneficent rationality. People no longer lived from day to day, piously guided only by the past, reliving it in myth and ritual, but fearful of any new departure, lest everything be lost. Writing and architecture, indeed the city itself, became stable, independent embodiments of mind. Though urban life developed inner tensions and conflicts to which smaller communities were by reason of their like-mindedness immune, the challenges of this more open mode of existence open up fresh possibilities. If all the emergent advantages of these large-scale enterprises had, be, had been appreciated and the higher functions of urban life had been more widely distributed, then most of the early failings of the mega-machine might in time have been corrected, and even its incidental compulsions could have been lightened and eventually erased. But unfortunately the gods went mad. The deities responsible for these advances exhibited failings that affected the genuine gains, for they battened on human, on human sacrifices and meanwhile they invented wars as the ultimate proof of sovereign power and the supreme art of civilization. While the labor machine largely accounts for the rise of civilization, its counterpart, the military machine, was mainly responsible for repeating cycles of extermination, destruction and self-extinction. <laughs>